Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Molina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 301 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by my best friend in this world. It is, of course, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how you doing, man? I'm good, my man. How you feeling? Always good when speaking with you, Eddie. Always good when speaking with you. This show is kind of cool because we're doing our part for women's boxing, that's for sure. Two guests, both female fighters, both world champions currently. Um, I think it's got to be the first time we've ever had two women on the show, both obviously being fighters. Um, We've had multiple women on the show before, but all the guests this week... When I say all, I mean both guests this week, both females. I believe that's the first time that's happened. Anyway, before we get into all of that stuff, let's start with the review part of the show. We're going to start with a card that took place in Poland um, the week just gone. Former world champion Krzysztof Vladarczyk, now 59-4 and four with a draw. A unanimous decision for him over eight rounds against Vadim Novopashin, who is now 6-3. and three. A big mismatch on paper, but it is what it is. Is. Moving out now to the AT&T Center in San Antonio, Texas. This is the final card to mention of the review part of the show. There wasn't too much on last week. We're going to start here with the undercard. A brilliant fight between Amilcar Vidal, who's now 13-0, and and Emmanuel Alim, um, who is now 18-3 and with two draws. A majority decision over 10 there for Vidal. A really, really good fight. A lot of people not happy, though, with the outcome. A lot of people believing that Aleem did enough to win uh, to, to win that one it sounds like you saw the fight Eddie what did you make of it honestly that was one of the ones I've seen I, I seen clips of the uh, you know the main event but I missed the rest I feel so bad but yeah that was actually a really really good fight interesting all the way down to the wire the only thing was you know I don't even want to say the decision was that bad you know what I mean but most including myself, thought that Aleem won. He did more. Um, his, 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 he might not have landed all of the most telling bl- blows in the fight, but he was sure throwing in combination. He was, he was, he was inside, outside. He was doing everything. Kid was, he was boxing beautifully. And I, from what I understand, he's, he's had a loss or uh, I think he has been stopped once too. So, you know what I mean? It's, it's, it was a nice thing to see him back you know, doing well. I mean, I really didn't have, I didn't, I've never seen him doing, uh, doing much of anything because I never watched him fight before until then. But he was like, he gave a good account of himself. And then you do all that work <laughs> just to turn around and get a decision that you just, so, you know, I don't say you can't believe, but man, I mean, I guess it's boxing, but man, you know, you put that kind of work in, train hard, and, and you come in and you do the work, you do the job you're supposed to do, and you still don't get the decision. It's a rough kind. It's a rough sport, man. It's a hard way to make an easy buck. You know what I mean? For sure. And um, I felt that Alim may have nicked it. It was definitely a close fight. Um, Vidal being the kind of home fighter, if you like, being with the uh, the promoter and stuff like that. He was twelve and zero with eleven KOs, but the power didn't seem like it was. Um, I don't want to say legit, but. Um, Aleem was able to eat shots pretty much all night, and it didn't seem to bother him, the power, at any point. Um, I didn't like Aleem doing the... I know you, some people have to do this sometimes, but the pitter-patter kind of punches where he'd throw yeah. like six tapping shots, stuff like that. Uh, Vidal yeah. would load up with one big one, it'd land, and he'd take it quite well. But yeah, I'm not a massive fan of that, but he probably did enough to win. But like I say, close fight. Still, for me, I can't believe I keep saying this, but one of the best fights 
in terms of undercard fights that we've seen in 2021. Um, moving up the card once again, let's talk about now Rolando Romero, now 14-0, and a TKO for him in seven rounds against Anthony Yigit, who's now 24-2 and with a draw, the former European champion. It was for the WBA interim world lightweight title. The belt wasn't on the line for Ligit, uh, for Yigit, sorry. He, he weighed in 5.2 pounds heavy. The reason for this is because he was scheduled to fight on the undercard at 140, and it was a last-minute change for Rolando Romero. His opponent pulled out on fight week, so Yigit basically jumped into that fight there, and he was scheduled to weigh 140 for his fight. So he was overweight. The belt wasn't on the line. He was down in the fifth and down twice in the seventh. Romero had a point deducted himself, though. Um, Yiji actually boxed with, you know, a, a bit of heart. I expected the stoppage for Romero, I'm not being an after-timer by saying that. Just the fact that it was a late replacement, you know... Um, Coming off two years out as well, Anthony Yigit, who's a tough guy most of the time. He was a tough guy here, but he just, I don't think he was, um, you know, ready for the explosiveness of Romero, who, uh, who is a guy that I'm paying a lot of attention to. I think he could be really special in the future. Um, but yeah, I felt sorry for Yigit. You know, it's supposed to be a get back fight, I think, and he gets stopped. I'm not sure where he goes from there. Um, the main event, though. Jamel Charlo defending his WBC, WBA, and IBF World Super Welterweight titles against the WBO champion, the undefeated Brian Carlos Castaño. Um, now both guys have a draw, ended in a split draw after 12 rounds. A lot of people on this one felt that Castaño did enough. Um, I didn't see a single person on Twitter aside from... Clarissa Shields, who had it to Charlo, um, I think Showtime put out a put out a Twitter poll who won the fight. Seventy six percent with Castaño, twenty four with Charlo. Um, even Charlo's corner man, Derek James, told Charlo at the end of round eleven that he needs a knockout to win, but he still managed to keep his titles. Um, Again, you said you saw clips of it, Eddie. I'll come to you in a moment. Very, very, very good fight. It seemed like mm. Charlo hurt um, Castaño early, and then he tried to step on the gas. It looked like it was going to be an early night for him. And then, of course, um, you know, he got through that round. I think it was round two or three. And Castaño come back strong, and he seemed to hurt Charlo a few times in the fight. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I, I thought Charlo would win on points. I thought if it was close, they're probably going to give it to him anyway. But, um, cool. yeah, draw. Not really something that either man wants. We need the rematch. We were robbed ourselves of seeing one clear, undisputed champion at 154. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Once, like I said, once you have an opportunity for something like this, leaves a sour taste in your mouth if you can't actually get it. You know what I mean? So, to watch you know, the fight and see how it went down. And most people thinking Castaño won from the clips I've seen. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard when you watch clips to actually get a real, the real gist of the fight and you just, you got to see it round by round, but it obviously looked like the kid was in the fight and he was doing a hell of a job. It's just, you know, I, you know, Ch Charlo, those guys are really, really explosive. So if they land shots, man, it's, it's you're hard pressed to survive. You know what I mean? And, but I can kind of understand why the fight went the way it did in a sense when you hurt somebody early and then they survive, you put a lot of effort in getting them out. It's not necessarily that you're tired. It's just that, you know, you just kind of, your game plan kind of went out the window a little bit and you kind of get stuck in this mode of, well, I can hurt him. You know what I'm saying? I, I can get him out of there. Then you just continue to try and you don't go with the original game plan. So now you're fighting kind of, you know, with, with you know, you're just spinning your wheels and this guy's got himself back together, trying to find a foothold into the fight. He starts putting, you know, putting shots together. He starts doing things that he's famous for and comfortable with. And you're somewhat out of character. And now how do you rein yourself back in? It's kind of hard to do sometimes when um, when you're having a tough night, you know what I mean, even after having so much success early. So I can see why that kind of thing can happen. I would, in a rematch, favor Charlo to win, probably end up stopping him at some point in the fight because at this time he's going to go in with the idea like this dude's serious. He's not a joke. I'm going to have to go in there and not saying that he thought that in the first place, obviously it's for, you know, for all the marbles with the belts, but 
he's going to go in with a more focused attitude, I would think, as, as well as the other kid, Will, but Castaño. But um, I just think those guys are really, really explosive. And honestly, I'm not the biggest fan of theirs. So it's it can, on, almost a little bit pains me to say it, <laughs> but no disrespect to them. It's just um, I, 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 I think that they're maybe a little bit too explosive. And at this point in their career with the way they're, they're going, I think that he's a he will be able to beat them in a rematch for sure. Maybe stopping them late. But uh, fair play to that from what I was seeing in the clips that I watched, especially when I've never seen really seen Charlo hurt like that. But the kid really was on his in his behind. Pause. <laughs> so he uh, he definitely put some hand, put his hands on him a lot and, and had him working and unsure. And if his corner man was agreeing, then you know it's serious. So it's unfortunate, but that's how things go sometimes in boxing. Yeah, and I did my best to warn everyone on the podcast last week. I said Castaño has got a deep pedigree, man. He probably beat yeah. Eris Landy Lara in his in his one draw, and like I say, beat Errol Spence in the amateurs, who I forgot is is a stable mate, um, a gym mate of of, of Jamel Charlo. So uh, mm. yeah, he was at the fight as well, looking on. Um, so yeah, the guy the guy was no. You know, no, 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 no mug, as we'd say. Um, anyway, that's it for the review part of the show. Just before we wrap up part one, the final thing for me to do is to welcome our first guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the reigning and undefeated WBO Super Featherweight World Champion. It is, of course, Miss Michaela Mayer. Michaela, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure, Michaela. So first things first, it's great to have you on the show. You're without a doubt one of the top female fighters right now. Um, obviously, you know, you had a fantastic amateur career, beating a whole host of the best women out there. You made it to the Olympics in 2016, and your pro career seems to be going pretty amazing too. Are you happy with how things are going so far? I guess so. <laughs> yeah, I really am. I'm really I really don't have many complaints. Um, you know, I always said I would never turn pro unless I had the backing of a major promoter. And just for obvious reasons, I didn't want to sit on the shelf as a pro, like a lot of women have in the past. And top rank has moved me well. I've 15 times, I fought 15 times in a little over three years. And now I'm world champion. So I'm in a great position. Absolutely. And I feel like as soon as you turned pro, it was only a matter of time for me anyway, before you became world champion. I felt the same about maybe two other Olympians from the USA team, uh, probably Shakur Stevenson and Clarissa Shields, maybe Gary Russell. But anyway, let's talk about that night your, your world title ambitions came to fruition. Halloween night 2020, uh, you boxed the undefeated Teak Tough world champion Eva Brodnicka, a points win over 10. Tell me about that night in your own words and what, of course, it meant to you, Michaela. It was an interesting night. Um, it was, I think I'm one of the few boxers in the world to have fought, you know, a world title fight in the heart of the pandemic or in the height of the pandemic with no audience. And so it was a little underwhelming in that sense because obviously there's a whole new energy that the fans bring to the table. And I missed out on that. And um, you know, she didn't bring my belt into the ring, so I didn't get that that chance to have the belt put on my waist and um and then also it was kind of an annoying fight for me, to be honest, because we knew she was gonna be a tricky style. She's not really like the toughest person to fight, right? Like it's not like she made it like a tough or a rough match, but she would just run and she's on her bicycle, circling the ring, running, moving, and the second you get in close, she wants to tie you up and lean on you. So it wasn't an it's not a fun style to me. I don't think it's an entertaining style. I don't like it, but it worked. It got her to 19 and 0. So I, I didn't I didn't love the fight, but I did what I had to do to to get the win decisively, and I did. Um, but that was a little bit, like I said, an underwhelming world title experience. <laughs> hey, well, I'm sure there's plenty more to come for. <laughs> um, you've defended. Exactly. That was. Yeah. <laughs> You've defended the title, obviously, just the one time, which was back in June against former two-weight world champion and, again, very tough Erica Farias. Um, again, another mm -hmm. dominant win for you. I remember staying up till about 2 or 3 in the morning UK time to watch it live. Tell me about that one there. I love that. I love that you guys were able to watch it over there. Um, <laughs> yeah, we knew she was going to be tough and experienced. It's one of the reasons top rank gave me that fight they didn't want to give me someone just because we really wanted to go 
um, and we want to go undefeated. We wanted to unify right away, but we couldn't get the deal going with Hamadouche in time. And Top Rank said, we got to give her someone tough. So I'm going to make her better within, within this time before she goes to unify with another champion. Let's give her someone durable and strong. And that's why they're one of the best promoters in the world. That's what they did. That's why they built stars. They gave me a very tough, durable, experienced opponent in Eric Arias. And she, she brought it. We knew she was going to be aggressive and try and come at me hard. And that's exactly what she did. And it was an entertaining fight. But I think that I was a superior boxer and it showed, especially towards the second half. Absolutely. I agree with that every word of it actually um you mentioned her there i want to ask what exactly happened with um maver hamadouche because if i'm not mistaken you were contracted to fight then she decided she wanted to fight in the olympics am i right what's what's happening with that i'll straighten this out because i've been transparent about this i put it on twitter and everything i wanted to, i wanted to unify right away and i made that clear and eddie hearn tweeted how about you take Maeva Hamadouche next and I said you know who to call I'm I'm there for it you know who to call so they started the negotiation process and I got word back soon after that um Hamadouche couldn't accept those dates and blah 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 the fight wasn't going to happen this time and I'm like well because she wants to go to the Olympics that's why and so I called her out on social saying fight's not happening Maeva Hamadouche thinks the Olympics is more important than defending her world championship belt so we're gonna let her go do that first she denied it, said, no, that's not true. I'm here. I'm ready to fight. But now we all know where's Hamadouche right now. She is in Tokyo, ready to compete the Olympics. So I was right. And now the fight is pushed back to November-ish. Okay, November-ish. So that will be your, your next outing. Yep, that's already done. The deal is done. I knew about it weeks before the Bari fight. I just couldn't say anything, which is rare. I've never had two fights scheduled and, you know, ready to go like that. But... We had to get through Fari first, and then I immediately announced that the Hamadouche fight has been done for weeks. Okay, and I love the way that you are very transparent, because again, you don't get this too much in, in, in boxing, not just women's boxing, but it's very hard sometimes for fans to follow what's going on, but you seem to be quite a straight shooter, which I think a lot of people appreciate. Um, I want to ask you this as well. Uh, it's a bit of a fun question here I'm going to just throw in. I know you've had... Um, a couple of little feuds, I guess, on, on, on Twitter. If you had to send a Christmas card, Michaela, to either Terry Harper or Steffi Ball, who's getting that Christmas card? <laughs> oh, I'm Steffi Ball and getting shit. And that includes my belt. He wants the attention. He wants to hop on Twitter and talk shit to my opponent for, or to Harper's opponent for her and, to me that's so unprofessional it's not what a coach should be doing coach shouldn't be worried about the limelight and the and the shit talk leave that up to the fighters i don't respect that at all but i'll send one to terry yeah yeah no i thought you'd say that because i don't <laughs> I'll feel send like a, it's... i'll send a nice little i'll send a nice little hurry and get well fast so that we can give the fans what they want Exactly, and that's a fight. That's a fight that all fans want. I feel. Um, I I do kind of get the impression that it's not like a personal thing with Terry. It's more towards Steffi. It's uh, it's yes. I, I see what's going on well, there. It was originally towards Terry. You know, let's let's get this fight done. Let's make things happen. And uh, the beef originally came when she got the title shot, ranked number thirteen, when I was number one contender in the division. And it you're gonna take what you can get. I get that, but. I'm going to say something about it. And I think that that needs to change. Like you should, it should be top 10 who gets shot at the world title. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying. A lot of people, I think almost forget that she somehow leapfrogged you into fighting for a world title. I still don't know how she did that one, but it is what it is. Um, a lot of girls in the super featherweight or lightweight division have a dream of fighting Katie Taylor. Is that something that's on your bucket list at all, Michaela? Oh yeah, that's always been on my on my list, and I've always talked about fighting Katie Taylor, and it it never happened in the amateurs, and I plan for it to still happen in the pros, and I'm hoping that once I go undisputed at 1:30, that we can work to make that happen. I think it'd be a great fight for the sport, and I think that who you know whoever does come out on top at 1:30 will will get that opportunity, and I hope it looks that to be me for sure. Yeah, for sure. Because I do I plan see. on moving. Yeah, you plan on moving. I do up. plan on moving. Yeah. Once I'm done unifying, I'm done at one thirty. I'm not coming back down. 
Okay, okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I just think it's it's a brilliant position that women's boxing is in, um, you know, for yourself to have, I guess, so many available, not available fights, but available opponents that people want to see you fight. It's like sometimes, you know, women's boxing gets kind of, I guess, underappreciated for the lack of competition that's there, the lack of fights that can be made. Whereas I feel like there's probably five or six fights that I personally would love to see you involved in. And it looks like you've you've got that attitude to make those fights happen, which, like I say, is, is excellent to watch from the outside. Um, tell me what happened. Well, that- Sorry, Michaela, go on. I just want to add, that is why 130 is the most stacked competitive division in women's boxing right now. There's so many matchups to be made. From 126 to 135, even to 140, there's so many fights to be made. And so that's the reason why we're on fire. And then also, it's another reason I kind of had to open my mouth on Twitter and start the talking. Because one thing boxing, women's boxing needs to continue to do is create rivalries. That's how you reel in the fans. And so that's what this division has. That's why we need to see you and Harper in the ring for sure. That's uh, that's a fight I really want to see. Tell me what happened, Michaela, with this ESBC boxing game. Because I saw you tweet something. Um, From my point of view, obviously, I'm sure you agree with this. It's amazing to see a new video game on boxing come out after so many years. The graphics look crazy. It's exciting. But I believe they came at you with a bit of a low offer or something. What exactly happened there? I've been doing deals for years with my manager. He's trained me really well. We've always gone over contracts together. He'll tell me why we're agreeing to this, why we're not agreeing to that, why we need to take this out, why we need to turn it down, what's good about it. He's always done that for me, and this contract is no different. There was things in the contract outside of money that we do not align with, that our beliefs don't align with, and I've always had to hold that standard for myself coming up as a woman in the sport and not being taken advantage of, and I'm going to continue to do that. And we didn't agree to the offer. We didn't like the offer. We didn't think it was fair. And so we didn't take it. No, well said. Well said. And um, I'm going to put you on the spot a tiny bit here. My last real question for you, Michaela. I want to ask, who springs to mind when I ask you, who is your favorite UK fighter? It can be male or female. It can be any era. It can be 100 years ago, if you like. Um, who springs to mind? And I just want to say before you answer, I've seen some brilliant recent photos of you with the likes of um, Tyson Fury and Josh Taylor. So I know you know your UK fight as well. <laughs> I was going to say, Tyson Fury, I mean, I really do love him. I think that he's a great heavyweight boxer, he uses his jab, high punch count, is exciting. And boxing needs a personality like that. I think sometimes the UFC kicks our ass when it comes to like entertainment because they let their personality shine through so much and people love it. They love it. And I think that Tyson Fury does that for boxing. So he's up there and I will not lie. When Josh Taylor came over here to fight Ramirez, I became, I mean, he's suddenly on the top, my top five favorite fighters for sure. Like I love his style. I can relate to his style in a lot of ways because he's tall and can box, but he likes to take it to you. He will take it to you and, and hold his ground and, work your body and so i really like that in him and he's he's great he's definitely one of my favorites now there we go that's two amazing british fighters i'm sure everyone will will agree with that and just finally michaela if you've got any closing words particularly to your fans here in the uk i know that you know you get a lot of support here in the uk um what's your message to your supporters from all over the world but also the uk Oh my gosh, I hope I have a lot of supporters in the UK. I hope I haven't scared them all away um, <laughs> with my with my fattiness on Twitter. But uh, no, I really am really looking forward to one day coming over there and competing for all the supporters in front of in in the UK and also all of my non supporters. I tweeted not too long ago. I'm kind of excited to go across the pond and get booed on my way to the ring. There's something about that element and it kind of hypes me up and so I'm looking forward to meeting both. Well, I will be cheering if I'm there, Michaela, and I hope I hope I will be there if, if if the fight does happen. I hope we do see you here in the UK. I'm sure a lot of people would agree with me. Um, I just want to say it's been an absolute honor having you on the show, Michaela. Thank you for your time. I can't wait to see you back in the ring October time, and I hope we can speak sometime after that. Yes, whenever. You know my you know my contact now, so we'll talk soon. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Few bits of news to go through. Firstly, the unfortunate postponement of Fury Wilder 3. It's been moved um, to October 9th. Obviously, we know the pullout because, uh, you know, Tyson Fury had some COVID. 
people or whatever covid infected people in his in his camp so the new day october 9th at the t-mobile arena in las vegas it's good to see the fight uh, rescheduled quite swiftly i guess um it's a fight we just want to get out of the way really for what's next to be honest we just hope that tyson fury doesn't uh, look past Wilder for any seconds in that fight because it only takes one punch, as he knows. Um, Frank Warren has announced a card that will be taking place on. Um, oh gosh, when is it actually? This is took me uh, by surprise. August twenty eighth. It's going to be uh, Brad Foster against Craig, not Craig Cunningham, Jason Cunningham. That one is for the EBU European, British and Commonwealth Super Bantamweight titles. Elsewhere on the card, Anthony Kakachi defending his British Super Featherweight title against Leon Woodstock. Um, we've also got Nathan Heaney featuring on the card, Anthony Yard, Liam Davies, and Sam Maxwell against Akeem Ennis Brown for the British and Commonwealth Super Lightweight titles. That's a cracking night of boxing there in Birmingham. Actually, I might even uh, try and attend that one. That sounds good to me. Elsewhere, Matram have announced this one. It's going to be July 31st, so... What's that? Um, next weekend or whenever it is, we're going to see Kan Zhu defending his WBA featherweight world title against Lee Wood. That's going to be on the Matram Fight Camp um, first night, which is, uh, like I say, July 31st, live on the Zone. Um, in other news, we have the announcement that Anthony Joshua defends his titles against Alexander Usyk at the Tottenham Hotspur Football Club Stadium. September 25th, no undercard announced just yet, but that's the date. Um, wow, I mean, this is a fight I think we all knew would be coming next, I guess, for, for quite a long time now, but such a tricky one, Eddie. And when I, when I see people yeah. discussing this online, there's a mixed... A mixed amount of opinions, and the one I'm seeing most of is that Anthony Joshua is going to walk through Usyk and stop him. Um, I'm seeing that a lot. I personally think he's a bag of tricks, and I mm. might even smell an upset in that. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad, bad decision to make. I mean, he doesn't look great as a heavyweight, but it's a different, different weight class, a different situation. You have to be prepared for um, differently. Um, Anthony Joshua was big. He's strong. You know, he's athletic. Usyk is really skilled. Got a crazy pedigree. He's uh, been a world champion many, many times over at Cruiser. His pace will be a lot faster than what Anthony Joshua really, really is going to be used to in a sense. Or has he completely got indoctrinated into the uh, heavyweight pace, which would not be good for uh, Usyk. But um He's real tricky. He has some 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 dimensions to his game. You know what I mean? But all those dimensions can be wiped away with one shot. You know that. You know what I mean? So it's really difficult to kind of disagree so hard with the guys who say he can walk through him because that's a possibility. But Anthony Joshua doesn't have the granite, granite chin that everyone, you know, would, would say is like, oh, he, he's just going to walk through him. And won't be able to take his shot with no problem because you never know. You know, Usyk lands one of those surprise, quick little shots on the chin. You never know what might happen. You know, nobody thought that Andy Ruiz, Andy Ruiz would stop Anthony Joshua. And I'm not saying that that's the kind of thing that's going to happen here. I think it'll be if if um, Usyk was to win, it's probably going to be by decision. But it's a very interesting fight, man. Extremely interesting. I'm actually really looking forward to that when I heard it. When I'm hearing it now, September is only a couple months away. It's like, yeah, I want to see that one. I just want to see what happens. I want to see what Anthony Joshua does, and how he deals with this kind of guy. Because, you know, people always looked at, you know, guys that were going to fight me. They were big and big punchers. And, oh, he's going to run right through them. And it's, it's a different thing when you got skills, man. Skills pay the bills. Trust me. Yeah, it's a fight I'm thoroughly looking forward to. I hope there's a good undercard. Um, it's you know it's going to be certainly one of the hardest fights of of Joshua's career. Um, I really see it being a, 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 a you know a puzzle. I really do. I think it's mm. it's going to be tricky. There's a lot of people kind of going off both their last fights. You know when when Joshua fought, fought Pulev, people are. People are not really looking at that. They're saying, I read something on Twitter today. Someone said, if that if that fat guy from America can land 
they're talking about Andy Ruiz. If he can land on on Joshua, then you sick can. And then someone yeah. countered that by saying, well, if if um, you sick can have a close fight with journeyman Derek Chisora, what's Joshua going to do? So you know that's not it's not that's not how it works. We know triangle theories do not work and, and do not talk about that fat guy from America, Andy Ruiz, like he exactly. ain't serious. That's exactly. disrespectful to him and disrespectful to Joshua. See, that just doesn't make sense to me. And then talking about, you know, Chisora as a journeyman, whether he may be not past his prime, he still has a mentality and a heart that, that just is in, in his and in, in styles make fights. So we don't look at other opponents, especially so different as they are, and try to match these two guys up based on that doesn't make sense. If you look at their last fights, if they had looked like they were really slipping, that's one thing. But to look like you're having a tough fight with a tough guy, that doesn't make sense to me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But yeah. let people be, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's such an interesting one because, and I don't want to spend too much time going into this because, you know, it's, it's not like the fight's happening this week. But I don't think it's going to be like a... I'd be stunned if Josh if Joshua got Usyk out of there within six rounds. I don't think he really does that anymore. I can't think of the last time Joshua got someone out that early now. Um, I'd have to really rack my brains. Let me actually just have a quick look at that. When was the last time Joshua got someone out before six rounds? You've got to go back to... Oh, boy. You've got to go back to 2016 when he knocked out Eric Molina. Um yeah, so that was quite a while ago now. Um, and it makes you think, when the fight goes late, that's when Usyk really should be having his best moments. And, yeah, I don't think he's he's going to go late this fight. I can't see a, an early stoppage or anything like that. And when it goes late is when it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, he's not going to walk forward, Anthony Joshua, like Derek Chisora. Just walking through the guy, taking loads of shots to land the big one. He, he doesn't fight like that. It's going to be a boxing match. And it's going to be very interesting. But moving on to the preview part of the show, we're going to start here with a card that takes place later today in Moscow, Russia. Over here, Murat Gassiev talking about cruiserweights moving up to heavyweight. He boxes for the vacant WBA Asia heavyweight title. Gassiev, 27 and 1, takes on Michael Wallish, who's 22 and 4. He's been stopped in all four of those losses. So um, he got stopped by, I think it was Effie. Jagbar, he got stopped by um, Tony Yoka, Joe Joyce, and Christian Hammer. Um, I don't see Gassiev really struggling with him. Um, elsewhere, we have, well, on the undercard, Vladimir Nikitin gets out as well, 4 and 1 with a draw in an 8 rounder against Ralph Agaev, who is 31 and 9. And uh, Mikhail Aloyan as well, 6-1, and one, the former entrant of the World Boxing Super Series in a 10-rounder against Machanya Johanna, who's 12-2. and two. Moving out now to Germany at the Firat Arslan Sports Center. Who do you think is topping this bill at the Firat Arslan Sports Center? It is Mr. Firat Arslan. He's boxing in a venue that's named after him. You, you can bet your... Uh, Bet, bet everything in your pocket that if it goes to the decision, they can't rob Firat Arslan in his own building. He is, though, 50 years of age, 48 and 9 with three draws in a 12 rounder against Ruben Acosta, who's 38 and 17 with five draws. Ruben Acosta, 42 years of age himself. So the combined ages of these two men, 92 years of age. Um, yeah, that's going to be something. Moving out now to the Wembley Arena in London, United Kingdom. Over here, let's start with the undercard. Return to the ring for Charles Frankham. He's been out the ring for a long time. He's in a four-rounder against 1-27 and Dean Jones. You've got Sam Noakes out again. He was boxing... I think a couple weeks ago. He's 6-0, I believe, with six KOs. He takes on Michael Carrero, who's 13-64 and 64 with six draws. Uh, elsewhere on the card, heavyweight David Adelaide, 6-0 and in a six-rounder against Mladen Manev, who is 3-9. You've got Chris Balk, 9-0 in a 10-rounder against James Beach Jr., who's 12-1. and one. That's for the WBC International Super Bantamweight title. Great fight, that. Hamza Shiraz, 12-0, takes on Ezekiel. Guria, who's 15 and 1. Hamza Shira has been out there in the States in California training at the Joe Goosen gym. Um, 
10 Goose Boxing Gym with Ricky Funes. Ricky Funes has came over to the UK. He's in that corner with Hamza Shiraz. Um, Shiraz has been spying a lot of people out in that gym. I'm excited because um, he is a bright prospect. He has been for years. Carl Frampton said he's the best prospect in the UK. He defends his WBO European Super Welterweight title. I think he's going to stop this guy quite early, though. The guy's been stopped in his one loss, um, Ezekiel Guria, 15-1. and one, And it was by a guy who wasn't really a puncher. I think Hamza Shiraz will walk through this guy here. Elsewhere on the undercard, the son of Don Charles, George Fox, 3-0. In a four-rounder against debutant Reese Barlow, you've got Chris Jenkins, 22-3 and three with three draws. In a 12-rounder against Echo Essiman, the former English champion, it's for Jenkins, Commonwealth and British welterweight titles. That's a brilliant, brilliant fight there. That is a brilliant fight. It's definitely going 12 rounds, I think. And the main event, I don't think this one's going to go 12 rounds. Joe Joyce, 12-0, and 0, defends his WBC silver heavyweight title and his WBO international heavyweight title against the, the very tough Frenchman, Carlos Takam, 39-5 and 5 with a draw. Um, Carlos Takam, I'm starting to think, is a little bit past it now. I can see Joe Joyce stopping him around about the midway point. Um, but yeah, we've We've flown through that preview part. If you wanted to add anything to the Jewish Takam fight, Eddie, you're welcome to. Otherwise, we shall move on. That's actually an interesting fight. I mean, that's a good, another good test for Joe Joyce. Joe Joyce, honestly, man, I mean, to the uh, to the eyes, not super aesthetically, you know, pleasing with his style and the way he throws punches, and he's not really fast and all, but he just, for whatever reason, he just wins. Keeps getting the job done against people. Well. Well, in, in particular, one uh, fighter, Daniel Dubois. Uh, when you just you look at Dubois, he just looks the part, big, strong, you know, explosive puncher. You know what I mean? Joe Joyce is a good puncher himself, but just you would just think it would go the other way, and it doesn't. So you know, Tucker comes like still another. You know, he's a he's a different kind of guy. Tough to get out of there to a degree. Um, you know, tricky. You know, he, like you've seen with uh, with Anthony Joshua. Seems like he's the kind of guy that can give problems to big guys because of his defensive movement, just his movement in general, and the way he moves in the pace he fights at. So, I mean, it could it could make things interesting with the fight. But I agree, Joe. You know, mid to late rounds, probably stoppage, maybe even maybe even sneak sneak one in early. You never know. So, it's interesting, but I still think uh, Joe Joyce is going to get him out of there pretty pretty easily. Um, yeah, I think so too. I think the timing is on Joe Joyce's side. However, Carlos Takam has never been stopped in the first half of a fight. He's only been stopped three times um, in round 10 against Povetkin, in round 10 against Joshua, and in round 8 against Chisora, a fight that he was winning until he walked onto a big haymaker. Other than that, obviously, his losses were to Joseph Parker on points and... Um, I think it was early on in his career to Gregory Tony over eight rounds. Um, yeah, close one that. So um, no, he's coming off a couple wins, obviously against uh, Jerry Forrest last time out and Fabio Maldonado before that. He's picked up four in a row, but yeah, I think Joe Joyce is uh, going to be too much for him. But I like the way they've been promoting this fight. It's been promoted quite well. Anyway, that's it though for the preview part of the show. We've brought you in part one the review part and the first guest in part two we've brought you the news and the preview in and the final thing for me to do is to welcome our second and final guest on this week's podcast ladies and gentlemen please welcome the reigning ibf super lightweight world champion it is of course miss mary mcgee mary welcome to the show hey thank you guys for having me it's absolutely my pleasure, Mary. So it's your first time on the show. The majority of our listeners, of course, are, are here in the UK. Just give us a brief backstory on your story for those that aren't too familiar with your name just yet. Well, I've been a boxer for over 20 years. I started when I was 14, so I had a amateur career. Um, I went to the pros maybe when I turned about 18, so I racked up a record of now 27 and 3 with 15 knockouts. I've currently held the IBF since December of 2019, and um, I'm working on facing more champions and becoming a greater champion. <laughs> Absolutely. And like you say, you've been a pro 16 years. You turned pro in 2005. 
like you say, when you were 18, uh, you've had the 30 fights, you had that one no contest, which um, is equivalent, really, to less than two fights a year, because two fights a year over 16 years would be 32 fights. I know during your pro career, you've had right. two year, uh, a couple of two-year layoffs. Um, how come you've only had the 30 fights in 16 years? It's not that much activity. Well, if you look at the numbers in women boxing, it's not that many. Mm-hmm. So sometimes it's hard to find fights. And with a record like mine, sometimes it's hard to get a fight sanctioned. And Absolutely. then a lot of the girls that are are within, let's say, with equal amount of fights or, you know, experience as myself, they stay in different countries. And it's expensive to get them to travel here. So back in, I think, 2009, I had a promoter named Octavius James. And I had made it to 17 and 0 with under him, but he passed away, and he was funding a lot of my fights. So when he passed, those were the where the layoffs came in at because at 17 and 0, it was like girls wanted ten thousand dollars to just come and fight me, and I didn't have it just sitting in my pocket. So without a promoter, it was hard to get fights. Plus, I had a baby too. So. Oh, okay, okay, and I'm guessing you must have been surely work in a secondary job during some of your boxing career to keep things oh, afloat. Yeah. Tell me about that. What job or oh, jobs yeah, have you had? Job. I've had a job since I was, I want to say 18. I was a, a caregiver. I worked as a CNA and a home health aide, which I enjoyed, but um, it didn't pay a lot. And then it was taxing on my body and my back. And then I would do that and then have to go to the gym and train as well. So I did that all the way up until 2019, actually, when I won the title. I came back and I worked for a little bit, but the team that I was working with advised me to kind of focus more on boxing. Yeah, okay. No, that's great to hear that, because like I said, a lot of people don't know about these kind of things that boxers have to go for, especially, uh, you know, in women's boxing as well. One of the things that I love most about boxing is that a loss can either make you or break you. After losing for the first time, some people completely write you off. I want to talk about that that first loss that you picked up against Brooke Deardorff. It was a close one over six rounds, though. Did you feel you did enough there, Mary? No, I didn't. I didn't even train. I was um, I was in a state where I had <clears throat> a few months before I had lost my brother, and then I had lost my promoter, the guy Octavia. So that's the fight came after him, and <clears throat> when I fought her, um, I wasn't mentally focused at all. But I thought me being <clears throat> seventeen and zero, excuse me, me being seventeen and zero at the time. I felt like, oh, well, I haven't been beaten, and I was young, so it was a lesson learned. I took the fight thinking, oh, I can beat her, whatever, and I didn't train how I should have, and she trained hard for me. So she outworked me, and by me mentally not being focused, I just didn't have enough to pull through the win, and I got my first loss. And And I'm glad I got my first loss. Yeah, you're honest about it. As you said, it was was a lesson. Um, even though what I say about losing for the first time in a boxer's career can make you or break you, there's two types of losses when it comes to losing on points. A close loss, obviously, and a wide loss. Um, That loss, you know, there's a reason behind that. That's fine. Sometimes mentally in a close loss, some people still consider it a win. I know you didn't do it with that one, but um, when there's a wide loss, how you rebuild, how you come back from a wide loss shows the character, shows what's on the inside. And this brings me perfectly mm-hmm. into the year 2013, which I'm guessing probably isn't your, your best year to, to look back on. Uh, you had the two back-to-back losses uh, with Holly Holm and then, of course, Erica Farias. Now, both losses, particularly the first one, were wide losses on the cards. Give me a quick rundown on those two fights and I guess the place you were in mentally at the end of 2013 after suffering those two wide losses. Well, once again, see, 2013 is a few years ago. I was still young and immature. But with the Holly Holmes loss, Holly Holmes was just at her best at night. It was her last fight in boxing. She was older than me then. I think she was the age I am now, maybe 32 or 33 years old. She was somewhere around in there. And she was just at her best. She was focused. She was in great shape. Because um, maybe later I'll send you this picture of me and her on the scales, and you can just see the difference in our bodies that she was just ready. And <clears throat> I feel like I did 
okay in that fight, being that I was dealing with such a stronger opponent. But even when she would hit my arms, it was like, oh, my gosh, she's so strong. And she was just on fire that night. So that was her night. Now, the fight with Erica Farias, um, I, I try to be the type of person that don't make up any excuses, but I don't feel that I was really treated fairly in that fight. If you go back and watch the fight yourself on YouTube, you'll notice that the, you know how when you go to the corner and some fights they'll show what's going on in the corner and the rounds between. They cut they cut those round they cut that out because the referee came to me and my coach every round and threatened me. I'm gonna take a point away from you if you do this. I'm gonna take a point away for this. So I just I been by me being young and not mentally strong, I wasn't able to tone that out. Okay. Yeah, if you go watch the fight, they don't show the rounds in between, none of them. Because every round, the referee came to my corner and warned me for something. Then he took a point away from me, he said, for using my arm. So, yeah, with that fight, um, um, it's a lot of variables that went into that fight. For one, when I got to the airport, I went to the international airport in, I think it was Miami here in America. When I got there, they said that the person that booked the tickets didn't pay a, right, a reciprocity fee. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a fee. It was something new, I'm guessing. Um, it's a fee that you had to pay to enter the country. So being that that fee wasn't paid, I couldn't travel. I had to sleep at the airport overnight. So me and my trainer stayed at the airport while my manager was on the phone trying to fix it. He finally got a fix. He had to pay 300 and some dollars for us to travel. But this is something that Erica's promoter was the one who booked the tickets. I'm sure they told him when he booked the tickets because they said that, well, whoever booked the tickets should have paid it. We tell them when they book them. So whoever booked the tickets was told, but they didn't pay it. So that left me stuck. So now I'm traveling. I'm thinking I'm going to get there with five days to rest. So I lose a day because I have to sleep in the airport. So now I get on the plane. I travel for 10 hours. So I'm from America to Argentina. It took 10 hours. So when I got there, now I have three days before the fight. So they put me on a bus. The bus took me on a ride 10 hours. or It was about nine or 10 hours. Me and my coach and another friend that was with us traveled because they didn't understand English and we couldn't really talk to them because we hadn't got to our interpreter yet. So we rode around all day trying to figure out what hotel we were supposed to go at. I'm drawing pictures and trying to explain to them where to take us. So when we finally get there that night, which is the third day, I have to lose these last five pounds because me been traveling for the last three days, I'm a little stressed, so I had water weight on me. So I had to lose those five pounds that night and weigh in the very next day Wow. and fight her the day wow. after. So for me, I don't feel like my shake was fair when I went over there. No, and that's that's understandable after hearing that. Like I say, it's fantastic. And I don't try to make so, excuses. I, yeah. Right. I don't try to make excuses. I accept the loss. It is what it is. It's a lesson learned. I know next time if I go to an airport and everything is not taken care of, I'm going home. And it's not my fault. It's your fault. <laughs> but I was so gun hold on wanting this fight and wanting to fight. I said, I'm going anyway. And my coach even said, we should go home because you're already you're so many hours behind them. Or, or like almost a day, I want to say, because it's a whole other country. He said, and you're not going to have any rest. I'm like, no, I want to go to the, I want to fight. So, you know. And there's another an old, lesson learned. Yeah, another lesson learned. There's an old saying, and it comes to, it comes in my head every time a fighter, I guess, takes a loss or a couple losses, then bounces back and goes on to achieve something fantastic, which you have. And we're going to get to that. But this saying... It always springs in my head, and, and it goes, only when the tide goes out do you discover who's been swimming naked. And what it basically means is that on the surface, everyone looks good, but underneath is where you see who's really got it and who's pretending they've got it. Um, obviously, year 2013, you know, you ended it on a positive note. You picked up a win in November that year against Lakeisha Williams. That's when you took two years out the ring. We didn't see you fight till October 2015. And since that return, you've turned into a completely different fighter, more focused, uh, more up for it, more on it, more motivated. Before we get up to date, just tell me what happened in those two years. Uh, did you do a lot of reflecting? What kept you out? Was that when you uh, had a had a baby at that point? 
Well, I had my son in 2014. Yes, okay. I got pregnant in okay. uh, 2013, and I ended up having my son in 2014 because I figured at the time it was like I was having so much bad luck in boxing, and I kind of was giving up at that time. Like, you know what? I don't know. Like, it's like everybody that loved me and that was a part of my career is gone now, and I just I had ended up getting pregnant, and I was like, well, if I don't have a baby now, then I probably never will. <laughs> So I had my son, and it was the most fulfilling thing that I've ever did. But inside of my heart, I wanted to box. Something inside of me just kept saying, no, you still have something left. You haven't completed it, and you're going to regret it if you don't go back. So when I came back in 2015, it was kind of premature because I had a cesarean section when I had my son. So I saw a girl that wasn't becoming of me at the time, but I fought her to see if I still loved boxing. And when she hit me in my stomach, it kind of blew, blew, got bloated because my body wasn't ready to be punched after having a baby. Wow. So that's what led me to taking another layoff after that. Because I'm like, I have to really heal completely before I do this boxing thing. But I had in my mind when I came back in 2015 that I was going to become a world champion. I said, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to, this time, I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to put my 100% focus into the ring, and I'm going to see what I become. Yeah, and that's what you did. I've never done that before. Exactly, that's what you did. And like I say, since that comeback in 2015, uh, you've won six fights in a row. Let's talk about the biggest one, December 5th, 2019, against Anna Esteche, a former unified world champion. She'd never been stopped. Uh, tell me about the night you became the first person to stop her when you did so in round 10, uh, the final round, by the way, and finally, of course, became world champion after all the ups and downs that you've just told me about on the path to get there. That night was... <clears throat> That night was a year in the making for me. We had talked about that fight at the beginning of 2019. And it wasn't just necessarily her. My manager had said something about the IBF title, but then they were talking about, well, Anna Stache is um, the one to fight for it. And it was a plan for me to end up going back to Argentina, which I was not happy about. But I was like, I'll go anywhere to take my chances at being a world champion. I said, I feel like I'm focused enough now that I can do it. So things kept going wrong. The fight kept falling through. But that entire year, I trained with my one focus on becoming a world champion. So when the night finally happened, when I first fought her, the first, I want to say, maybe six rounds, I fought on autopilot because I was just so shocked that I was actually having this moment. So I don't remember the first six rounds of the fight. I tell my coach that all the time. He was like, you were doing good. I said, I do not remember nothing I was doing. But when I finally woke up in the fight, I was like, wow, I'm in this fight. And I looked at my opponent, and I, I'm the type of person I've always been able to tell when somebody's being beaten by me. I can, I'm very good at reading energy and language. And me reading her body language, I can tell that I was breaking her down. So – by being a veteran of the game, I said, well, I'm breaking her down. I kept doing it round for round. So in the ninth round, after the ninth round, my coach was talking to me. I happened to look over his shoulder at a statue, and I could just see she was beat. And I said to my coach, I'm going to go out here and blow my wad. And he said, okay. What I meant by that was I was going to punch her until I passed out. <laughs> <laughs> I was not going to stop punching. Either one of us was going to fall or I was going to pass out from punching. That's how I felt. And I just felt as if I didn't know what happened in the first six rounds, so I didn't want to leave it to the judges. Yeah. No, it, was a, it was a brilliant performance, I like, like I said. I need a stoppage. Yeah. No, it was a, it was a brilliant performance. And to get the stoppage... To get the stoppage late on as well is is fantastic. Uh, you made your first defense only two months later, so February of 2020, right before the global pandemic started to take off. Uh, you boxed Deanna Hobbs. You became, again, the first lady to stop her also when you got her out in the ninth round. You clearly seemed to carry that power even in the late stages of the fights. You can see the fitness on display. Tell me about that win, of course, being your most recent. Ooh, that was a hard fight. That girl is so strong. She knocked my hearing out for three months. I couldn't hear out of my left ear. Wow. And I really think, I'm going to tell you the truth, I think I had COVID before they announced it. The reason I'm saying that is because in December, right after Christmas, my son was so sick 
I took him to the hospital. I took him to one hospital. They sent us home. He, he couldn't walk. He had muscle aches that were so bad he couldn't walk. And I'm like, my son can't walk. He's five years old. What's going on? So my mama was like, we finna take him back to the hospital. So we took him to another hospital. They kept him for like three days. So they was like, we don't know what's wrong with him. They shipped him all the way to Riley Hospital, which is like two or three hours from where I live. So I spent a week in the hospital with my son. And it was so many people there sick and wearing masks at that time before the, the, the announcement was made. But I was laying right under my son, and I kind of felt sick to myself. But he's my child, so it was like he needed my comfort at the time. I was giving it to him. So then I got back here in January. I trained, even though I didn't feel well, I still trained. And then when I saw her, I could kind of tell in the fight, I'm like, wow, it's like, I don't feel as good as I should, but no excuses still. I, I had just fought a world champion, so I, I prevailed too. But that girl is so strong. Like she, we were fighting and I felt her power. And I'm like, man, she's super strong. So she hit me in, I want to say the eighth, was it the eighth round? She hit me and my hearing got knocked out. And I told my coach, it, sound, it felt like I was underwater. Like the crowd was loud at one point, then I couldn't hear anything. So when I went to the corner, I said to my coach, I said, I can't hear nothing. And he mouthed to me what to do. And I said, okay. So I went back out and I knocked her down. So then after I knocked her down, we fought a little bit, and then I ended up getting a stoppage. Yeah, I really watched was it a the blast. other day. It was, it was fan- fantastic. Um you know your upcoming your upcoming fight, which which will be a defense of your IBF, and also for the vacant WBO, you'll be boxing Victoria Bustos. Uh, the fight takes place August twentieth in Cali. Uh, Bustos is another girl who has never been stopped. So you seem to keep fighting these girls who've never been stopped. Um, tell me about this this upcoming yeah. fight and uh, what you know about your opponent. Obviously, being very experienced, being in there with. Uh, Brackhouse, for example, Katie Taylor, Erica Farias twice. Uh, she's been a world champion twice before. Is this going to be your toughest fight, you believe? No, not at all. This is going to be my best performance ever. She said some things to me that's going to make me pull out my best stuff. She called me a little monkey. Wow. So I, wow. I, I lost a lot of respect for her because of that like fighters we 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 do little things to get under each other's skin at times which that's normal we're fighting and sometimes the psychological game is part of winning the fight so it was a post that was made about the IDF title and I had made a comment well Clarissa Shields which is my friend she came on there she made a comment and said well this post should say that Mary McGee, the IBF champion, is defending her title against Victoria Bustos instead of them putting Victoria as if she was the champion. So I came on and said, that's okay. I said, you know how they post things to make other people look bigger than other fighters. I said, they'll be posting me after I beat her around the ring, which I knew she would read that, but that was fine. It was a psychological game, which if you want to win a fight, you don't let people play the psychological game with you. She allowed it, so she came back and said whatever she said. You're going to have a bad time with me if you can't stop me, and you're all hype, and she did all that, so I said something back. But she couldn't take the backlash, so she came back and said a racial slur. She said, you're a little monkey. And I said, what? I said, well, I don't think – I mean, in America nowadays, we don't really deal with racism and things of that nature. Like, I'm not racist at all. I love all forms and fashions of people. You know what I mean? So I said, for me to know that that's what you are, cool. You know, so going forth in this fight, like, with her, the reason why I say I don't feel like she's my toughest opponent, she doesn't throw a lot of punches. She's never knocked anybody out. And that says one or two things to me. Either you have power and don't know how to use it, or you just don't have any. You don't know how to execute a knockout. So I'm not really afraid of her punch, or not even say afraid because I'm not afraid of anything. I'm not apprehensive. So Mary, thinking it, I might get hit with. Something. Sorry, sorry to cut you off. Is it is it is it fair to say that no, this good. fight this fight is personal? Well, for me, her, I, I, when I when they say personal, some people take that as personal as you'll fight with anger. 
for me, every fight in a way is personal because I'm doing this for a living to take care of my son. So I do want to win because I know winning is what will continue to put food on our table right now. So regardless of what she said, I'm still going to execute the game plan that my coach set forth for me to fight her. I feel like the style that she brings is perfect for me because, I mean, she's going to try to move and box or try to run from me, but I'm good at catching people and I, and I'm pretty accurate with where I land. And for her, it just gave me a little more motivation because not just necessarily her, it just, for people, for my people, the people that follow me, like I'm from the black community and mostly it's black girls or other black people that look up to me. So when they heard that she said that they're more offended than I am. So they want to see her be beat. So I have to give my people what they want. (laughs) Okay. Well, there we go. I mean, I'm excited for the fight. Um, I think it was obviously wrong what she said, but it seems like it's you, you've took a positive away in the term that it's going to give you that extra fuel, that extra kick. You're in the form of your life right now, so I'm expecting a, a, a fabulous display. Um, just briefly, I want to I want to ask you this: Katie Taylor is fighting a girl soon that no one uh, is really happy about seeing that fight. I I can't actually remember the girl's name at the moment. I mentioned to you that you'd be a great fight for Katie Taylor. That's a fight that also interests yourself, right? Yes, yes. Katie Taylor, I got a lot of respect for Katie Taylor. And people, the problem I have with people being upset about Jennifer getting the opportunity, what's wrong with that? Like, especially people like Jessica McCaskill's team that are the main ones saying we have no respect for Katie. Well, Katie took you on when you were nobody. She gave you a shot. So what is wrong with Jennifer Hunt getting her shot? And the problem is people have to understand women boxing is a pond and not a sea. And men boxing, to every one male fighter, there's another thousand in his weight class he can pick from. To every one female fighter, there might be 100 fighters, maybe 60 in her weight class to choose from. It's not that many. So everybody has to be given an opportunity somewhere or somehow in order for us to see if they even have talent. Jennifer Hahn might give her the best fight we ever seen. We don't know. But obviously she's somewhat worthy for her to get the fight. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, like like they they feel that she should only fight killers every time she steps in the ring. Not saying that Jennifer Hahn is not one. I don't really know of her boxing that well. But I've heard of her, like, in, like I've heard a few things lately since the fights come about. But beforehand, I didn't know much about her. But I'm just saying that to say they feel like Katie Taylor should only fight all of the killers. Though. That's not fair. Yeah, no, I understand where you're coming from. I think some people are a little bit frustrated that... Um that you know Jennifer hands only box once in the last three and a half years and really she's uh you know more of a featherweight than a lightweight but no I can understand what you're saying as well um you mentioned Jessica McCaskill and her team uh Rick Ramos a a guy I've seen you having exchanges back and forth with where did this issue start because I feel like there's a bit of beef there and um (laughs) we don't always see beef in women's boxing so I'm I'm curious to know uh this could be a and great the only fight down the line. That beast is Rick. <laughs> Just Rick. Hey, Rick, what? by the way, has got Rick has got clothing for every single uh, clothing item that there's ever been thought of. You can get any kind of Rick Ramos uh, gear. I believe he's even got, um, you know, t-shirts, hats, uh, flip flops. Even I see yeah. Jessica McCaskill with a with a swimsuit on that said Rick Ramos on it. Yeah, I think that's more so because that's her boyfriend. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm going to say this. Now, let's break the Ricky Raymond thing down. Back to the pregnancy, because this goes back to that. After I had my baby, a year later when I wanted to make a comeback, I went to the gym. When I went to the gym, they wanted me to spar. I hadn't sparred in a couple years. So my friends came in the bathroom and said, hey, be careful with that girl Jessica. She doesn't know how to work with anybody whatever, this is before she became the champion that she is, of course. They're like, be careful with her. She doesn't know how to work. I said, whatever. But me being a veteran in boxing for so many years, it's like riding a bike. I mean, if you're not 
on the level I am experience wise, I can outbox you without getting tired. So I got in the ring with her and I beat her. I outboxed her. And after I outboxed her, you know, we we me and Rick were kind of cool because Rick was like, well, um, you can spar with her or whatever. So we sparred together. So time went by on the, the road of me making my comeback. I needed a manager. So I saw Rick was doing pretty good with Jessica at the time. He was getting, he had got her the WBC fights to come up with Erica and me and him were talking. So I said, yeah, I'm thinking about working with you. Uh, I don't know. Rick said to me, he was like, well, right now I can't really get you a fight, but I can get you a bare knuckle fight. I said, bare knuckle. I said, I don't want to fight bare knuckle. It wasn't an interest in mine. I'm, I'm big on doing what's in your heart because that's where you'll succeed at. So I was like, nah, I don't think I want to do that. So I was talking to Brian as well. So Brian had said to me, what well, I want to work with you. He's like, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll get you three fights. The third fight will be a real title fight. I said, really? He said, you don't have to sign the contract until then. Oh, that was, that sounded right up my alley. So I told Rick, I said, Rick, I think I'm going to just go with Brian because I like the plan that he has for me. Rick kind of showed Grimms a little bit like, eh, you know, whatever. I thought we could still be cool after that by me coming to him respectfully and telling him, like, you know, I'm going to work with the other guy. But instead, Rick started jump talking me and he started, like, having little smart things to say. And as the bigger Jessica got, the bigger his head got. You know what I'm saying? So I came out and said, well, I want a fighter. Like, what fighter wouldn't ask to fight another world champion? I said, I want a fighter. She said, well, she don't have a world title. Get a world title and we'll fight. So then when I won my world title on December 19, I said, what's up? I uh, got a world title. You got one. Let's put them up. We fight. She ended up fighting Cecilia Brockett. Now I'm going to break that down. Cecilia Brockett was a great fighter at one point in time, but it comes a time where things get stale. You get, you know, you're not who you're supposed to be. I can say my time was in 2013. I was boxing for so long. I was wasn't doing what I was supposed to do mentally and physically, so I was losing. Same thing with Cecilia. You're 36 and 0. It gets boring after a while. You don't train as hard. You're 40 years old. Things don't come about the same. So Rick is, was pretty strategic in picking that fight. He picked her at a time where he knew she wasn't at her best. We all were going through a pandemic. You can tell that Cecilia, even watching her shadow box, I can tell that she had lost some of her love for the sport at that time. That's why I said I'm really good at reading energy. And the energy that you give off in training or the energy that you give off will tell me where your heart is. And you can kind of tell, and Cecilia said it, like, I miss my family, and she said all of that. So Rick was very strategic in picking the right fight at the right time. I give him credit for that. But at the end of the day, you beat a fighter that was not 100% herself. So they don't want to face me because you can see now that the hunger and the desire and my mental capacity is there, and he knows I'll beat Jessica. So it's an issue with the fact that I didn't sign with him. I beat Jessica every time we sparred each other. And every time he comes with a joke, I come with one funnier. So <laughs> that's the issue right there. <laughs> so so I don't want this to... Um... I want to keep this next question really short because I want to finish off with these final two questions. But now that you've said all that, and I appreciate no you saying that, I want this this answer to be pretty uh, brief. Who is the 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 girl that you want to fight most out of all the female fighters in the world? Is it is it McCaskill? No, I would say Chantel. Chantel. Chantel Cameron. Oh, okay, British. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> now I've got to ask why. <laughs> well, I mean, Chantel's a WBC world champion. She's undefeated. She's very respectful and she wants to fight. I like that. Like, she, me and her, if you go on Instagram, we just shared some stuff about each other recently and said that we have an ep epic fight between each other because I do see the hunger in her, too. And I feel like that fight would be great. You know what I'm saying? Somebody else that's just as hungry as me, young and on fire, has a world title. I'm I'm not in this game to hold belts to my hip. I want to fight and put on great fights. I, like I told a guy the other day, my goal in becoming a fighter was never to be undisputed. 20 years ago, undisputed wasn't a thing. I just wanted to fight the best. I wanted to be known as, I wanted people to look at me and say, man, that's a great fighter right there. I wanted people to see me in great fights, epic fights that have memories for years to come. That was always 
my goal. So I had to reassess my goal when all this undisputed and this stuff started coming about and reassess what my goal was, and that's my goal. And right now she's one of the best in my weight class. Yeah. And yeah, coming off a great performance last time out as well in the state, she made a yeah, US debut. So, yeah, I just yeah, think it's fabulous yeah, so that she's one of the. Sorry, sorry, Mary, go on. No, no, she is. She's one of the best in my weight class, and w- with all due respect, I I, I want to fight her. I believe that I can beat her. I'm sure she believes that she can beat me. But at the end of the day, it's a mutual respect between two champions. Yeah, no, I respect that, and I think not, this... I wanted to fight with McCaskey, but McCaskey doesn't want to face the best. She want to face fights that she knows she can win. With me and Chantel, even though I feel in my heart I can win because I'm supposed to, because I'm a champion, I know Chantel feels the same. But if you was to do stats, it's a fifty-fifty. That's great. <laughs> yeah, I just think it's brilliant that you've got you know. We're speaking about women's boxing right now. We're talking about you and there's people like Chantel, like Katie, like uh, like Jessica, all that you can match up with in the near future. I mean, it's just it's a brilliant position women's boxing is in. And I tell you what, I am absolutely here for it. Just before we wrap up, my final two questions for you, uh, Mary, is I want to put you on the spot a tiny bit here. Um, we like to ask this question to everyone that we speak to from overseas favorite uk fighter any era who springs to mind when i ask you that question oh anthony joshua <laughs> nice and easy it didn't feel like you had to think much about that one yeah, he's fine you know he looks good he can fight he's humble all that <laughs> okay this is not the first time we've had anthony joshua as that answer i understand for the reasons that you outlined uh just just finally mary if you've got any closing words just to to say to the listeners if there's anything at all that you want to say before we wrap it up uh, to anyone that may be listening and also please give them your social media handles as well let the people know where they can follow this journey um uh, well on Facebook, you can follow me at Mary McGee. McGee is spelled M C G E E. Some people get that wrong. On Instagram, it's under Mary Merciless McGee. You can follow me there, and I'm on. I'm also on Twitter. I think it's Mary the Champ on Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah, I believe so. But but um, closing words, I like to say, if you have a dream that burns in your heart, something that you just feel like you need to complete you should go for it because you don't want any regrets well said well said those those are the words of a champion on instagram by the way it's mary mcgee underscore champion on twitter it is mary mcgee champ so anyone listening to me now please go over there and follow this lady who believe me is only just getting started it would seem despite being a pro for 16 years it is fascinating but listen mary it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show this week thank you so much for your time best of luck august 20th and i'm sure we'll catch up sometime afterwards yes we will thank you so much Okay, and this wraps up episode 301 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our two guests on this week's podcast, the reigning and undefeated WBO Super Featherweight World Champion, Michaela Mayer, and of course, the reigning IBF Super Lightweight World Champion, Mary McGee. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. You are the people that make this show what it is. Thanks once again for tuning in but that's about everything from myself enjoy your weekends people stay safe and we shall see you all again next week